Call the meeting to order at 7.01. Please rise and join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God. All right, the first item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. I have a motion. Make a motion to approve the agenda. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes. Uh, we have a motion to approve the open session minutes of September 10, 2018. Make a motion to approve the open session minutes of September 10, 2018. Is there any discussion? Edits that needs to be noted. Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, session minutes pass unanimously. Um, next, we have community comments. Is there anyone from the community who wishes to be heard or recognized? <laughs> okay, hearing none, we'll move on to the superintendent's comments. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Joe is unable to attend tonight, so I'm going to give a couple of brief highlights about some activities that we have going on in the district. Um, first relates to our portrait of the graduate training. We have a couple opportunities for our staff to attend some training. So the first one is coming up pretty quickly on October 16th. We have a really large team, about 14 district representatives are coming from all four schools. We have administrators, teachers, and students who are participating in a training uh, that is a, a NEAS event. And it's called Building and Assessing Your Student's Vision of the Graduate, sponsored by the Vision Learning Partners. And part of the training will be reviewing some of the competencies, and we did some of this work during the strategic plan. And we have our outcome there with our profile of the graduate. Um, but they will also be prototyping performance tasks. Um, that will build the other student progress and skills of the graduate profile. So we know it's a great next step for us in our work with um, the portrait of the graduate and getting to know it and further looking to ways to assess it. We also this year have joined in to be a partner with a national organization. It's actually a network um, and it's called Ed Leader 21. And it's focused on integrating the four C's prior primarily, which would be that critical thinking, communication, um, collaboration, creativity, and education. And we are going to be, our leadership team is going to be learning about the resources um, on October 24th, and they're going to do a webinar with us. And Ed Leader 21 trains in developing portrait graduate competencies as well. So even though we've gone through that process, we're looking for more resources in regard to how to have uh, more performance assessments and Planning. Uh, we were really fortunate, uh, was it a week and a half ago now, that I did this one? Um, over a week ago, we had a Jay Fire, Jay Fire, and Sean Edison, myself. Um, we were able to go down to DC and represent men in Upton in the Green Brigham School um, ceremony. We were one of only 58 recipients and only one of uh, only six districts across the U.S. that was recognized on that date. It was a wonderful ceremony, and I definitely want you guys to join in as well in sharing about your experience. Um, I wanted to throw up here and 
highlight some of the elements that were in the plan. So in red, I just pulled out what, why we were recognized. So one had to do with the solar power purchase agreement that we had and the carports that you know are very highly visible over um, at MISCO. And we also are using green cleaning products that are green seal certified. Um, a lot of them use renewable fiber. And we again, I learned, I didn't, wasn't actually aware of this, but we have the green seal foam. Hand soap is used, it produces less lather, less water. So there are lots of different ways that we're trying to be more environmentally friendly. And we also were recognized because of uh, a program that was spearheaded by students at the high school here, in which they are trying to have a new partnership with the Maple Farm Sanctuary in Menden to take food waste from cafeterias and feed it to approximately 100 Western farmhouses of the Menden Sanctuary. I have to say, when we were up on stage, they went through and read um, from all the different things that we were doing. There was a gasp from the audience of a Oh, like that in the audience when they talked about when they mentioned this because this was unique. There were a, there were a lot of different um, gardens and farming and activities and events and courses that went across um, all of the areas, but this stood out and uh, so that, that was, it was great. I don't know if anybody else wanted to add. Well, just the, the thing that was most significant to me, yeah. while the animals in the, that's very good, <laughs> what was the uh, the amount of energy in our schools being used is basically all solar energy. Uh, it's, what was the percentage? Like 98 percent or so. I mean, that's that's impressive. I didn't hear any other recipients of the award saying that they had that kind of coverage. It was all like two percent, five percent solar, or 98 percent solar. And you had a figure for the savings per year as well. About 125. That's really impressive. 125 thousand dollars saved. So that. I'm not sure why we didn't get a big reaction about mm -hmm. that, but I didn't hear any comparable school across the country that had that kind of coverage. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, well done. I think this is just a little bit hard to do that this morning. Mm -hmm. Depends on which grade you come to that. She was not there. We got the under um, secretary. We did. The under secretary. Yes. She was great. He she was, was great. Yeah, it was really, really yeah. interesting to listen to. It, so it was a, a nice experience and was great to represent this district and all the great work that we're doing. So excellent. Um, so we're going to turn to Jay and just going to give a, a brief update for us on the budget. Um, so we're what, three and a half, four months into the year, we have spent a lot of money on building maintenance stuff, but then I just looked and we're still in, you know, reasonably good shape, but it seems like we're fixing a lot of things. Um, pipes that are leaking, you know, little pipes that get little holes in them at different schools, roof leaks with all of the rain. Uh, there's just been a lot of building maintenance stuff going on. As far as general operational budget, you know, we're in good shape. We've purchased a lot of stuff over the last four months to get school going, but things tend to slow down now. So, you know, as it stands right now, we're in good shape. Um, you know, we'll see how we go through the rest of the year. But assuming the buildings can hold up and we don't have any major catastrophes, I think we'll, you know, we should be relatively stable. Snow and ice is doing great. Snow and ice is doing really well. I was going to make another guard reference, but I think I'll leave it out at this point. <laughs> Uh, so next we have subcommittee updates. Uh, policy subcommittee met immediately prior to this meeting at six o'clock. Um, we need to bring about five policies in line with the work, uh, Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, adding information of, um, about pregnancy and pregnancy related conditions to our non-discrimination clauses in five different policies. So we reviewed and approved the changes this evening and you will have them in your packets for the October the full committee's review. First reading. Great. Um, unfinished business. Is there anything finished that we need updates on? This one? Okay. Hearing none, we'll move on to new business, which includes the presentation and approval of the 2018-19 school improvement plan. So you should have received in your packet or just passed out now the various improvement plans that all the principals and school councils have 
worked on. And we're going to go in order from the elementary schools and then the middle school to the high school. And they're going to give you a brief overview of the plans and then maybe just take some questions at the end. Does that sound good? Great. Um, so Deb and I, um, we work with um, Jen Mannion as well on our school improvement goals to try to get them uh, we feel it's very important to be consistent with the two elementary schools and working into middle school. So our first goal um, was one that we're very excited about. Um, this has been part of what we've been focused on for the last couple of years. So our first goal is to promote student success and reduce behavior referrals through the development and implementation of tiered SEL supports and intervention. So um, as Dr. Cohen has mentioned over the last year or so, we belong to the Excel network uh, training, so we participate in that. We've done a lot. Um, last year, Deb and I, um, along with several of our staff members, we went to a three-day training on the Positive Behavior Incentive Program in um, Mystic, Connecticut. It was incredible. There's people from all over the world there. We really delved into what PBIS is and how we might be able to bring this back to our school. So through the trainings and through um, forming our own committees in our schools, we have come up with our school expectations. So at Memorial, we use, they use the acronym RISE, standing for Respect, Inclusivity, Safety, and Empathy. And at CLEF, we are soaring. Um, we focus on the expectations of safe, being on task, acting ACR, which is our kind, caring, and respect being responsible. So we're in the process of um, rolling this out to the school and the students. And what we do is we've created um, matrix pieces, um, which you will see up here, the one for Memorial and then this one for CLEP. And what it is, it's student behaviors that we go through with the students through our PCR time, our second step time with our curriculum and with classroom teachers. Um, everybody's trained in what it looks like to be safe in the bathroom, in the cafeteria, in the hallways, in the recess, um, on buses, cafeteria, um, in all areas. So the whole thing is that you have consistent expectations. Everybody is aware of saying, you know, we're soaring or we're rising and um, rolling it out to the parents as well through uh, PTO, through our emails, through our newsletters. Um, every um, staff member in the district and the teacher has been um, distributed the social and emotional learning in the classroom book, so we're all becoming more educated through that. Dr. Cohen has a book talk that's for the district. Uh, Mrs. Swain and I are both holding uh, book talks as well to our faculty meetings to get them more, more engaged in sharing your techniques. So the whole focus between that, we're also rolling out a new second step. Um, it's been updated over the last few years. We finally have the updated version of the anti-bullying program that's incorporated into all classrooms for the week. Um, there's a lot of role modeling, a lot of um, talking about the problem solving, empathy, and um, we have committees that we meet regularly with. Um, so we're focusing on the tier one interventions because what we really truly realize is that, unfortunately, over the past few years, times have changed. Uh, a child can't, we can't teach them the academics if they're not there socially and emotionally. So we're spending a lot of time trying to help the teachers with the experiences and what they're dealing with with the children, and giving them the techniques and strategies that will help them. And um, we still have quite a few more trainings that we're going to. Deb and I are actually going to go to the author, he the author of the book, uh, in a few weeks, so we're pretty excited about um, talking and getting some more ideas. Um, and we're going to have train the trainers for each school that will also help spread the word. When we do the cafeteria rollout, we have the cafeteria manager, the recess monitors, and uh, being part of that so the children see that we're all working together and we're all talking the same. Um, so. The other thing is we're going to continue with teaching the social and emotional well-being and teaching our children to be good citizens through stuff like we have the Memorial Day and the Veterans Day concerts, we do the senior breakfasts, we do the pen pals, we do you know, the caroling, just food drives, um, yeah, and all the fundraisers and the learning culture. So we're trying to give 
teach the children the opportunities to give back to the community who have them. So we're excited about going forward and how we're going to be in our culture. And our second goal is to promote consistency among classroom and grade levels um, in regard to feedback as well as to improve our homeschool connections. Currently, we find that teachers are using a multiple um, different ways to communicate with parents to provide feedback for students. And the communication varies in modality, but also in frequency. So we're going to begin by brainstorming at a staff meeting, identifying what are the different ways that we communicate with parents. Um, some examples are Dojo, Connect5, um, teachers use Facebook, they use Twitter, newsletters, blogs, emails, phone calls. Um, and so based on feedback that we got from the in, um, K-12 Insight survey, um, some parents feel like there's not enough communication. Um, one example is we've got our kindergarten teachers using Dojo, so their parents oftentimes are getting pictures or comments or feedback on a daily basis. And then I had a first grade teacher this year that just came back from maternity and said, Deb, I've been in school for seven days, and eight parents want to know why I haven't been in touch. Um, so just looking to how, how do we have consistent expectations, consistency across the grade levels across the school. Um, we are also looking to provide all staff members with the information about the different mo modalities of communication. We've got just, you know, with any group of people, different levels of um, comfort with technology. So we're looking at making sure everybody is familiar with all the different types of communication and then really trying to identify what's best moving forward for us as grade levels in this um, schools. That was pretty cut and dry. So third goal is to increase our capacity regarding beliefs, cultures, and context of modern learning and project-based learning. And so we begin the school year by sharing sample goals, student learning goals, as well as sample professional um, practice goals with our teachers that included a variety of action steps <clears throat> that teachers could implement um, to help them become um, more comfortable and more familiar with modern learning strategies. Some of the goals included developing a method for students to share their learning with authentic audiences, implementing genius hours, flipping the classroom, challenging students to participate in authentic projects using the launch cycle, establishing classroom blog, visiting other districts, schools, classrooms. The staff has had an opportunity this summer and will again in the fall to participate in another book study based on project-based learning. Um, we will also be working with helping our teachers better understand the cloud's four big shifts, um, which include deeper learning, greater student agency, more authentic work, and richer technology infusion. So these are some of the areas, and as you can see, that's our mm -hmm. our whole team, um, because this really is a district-wide initiative. And then I sh um, shared with you some examples of things that are happening in the two classes already. Um, I know in my building, especially on days that happen to be half days or um, celebration days, they love doing STEM rotations as a grade level, and students will go from classroom to classroom um, the different types of problem solving STEM type of activities. Um, as you can see in one of our pictures, we have our teachers doing the marshmallow challenge. Um, so they're getting in there as well. We have maker spaces going on, um, genius hours, project based learning. Um, I was excited to have the opportunity this summer to sit in on the PBL training with some of my teachers and was so impressed with the projects that they're, that they're creating, the units that they're creating. Um, a quick example, um, the fourth grade teachers in my building will be addressing the regions of the country, but they will be doing it through the lens of natural disasters. So students will be learning about different natural disasters, the regions, and then communicating out the newscast, weather forecast, whatnot, how to prepare. So um, really exciting, exciting um, things that are happening. 
sums it up for the elementary schools. Thank you. Questions? Questions or? Okay. <laughs> Exciting. Exciting. I do have a quick question. So both the, the two elementary schools have two different acronyms. Is there a reason for that? Versus just choosing one that both elementary schools are working on. Yeah. I mean they are similar. You have they are similar. Yeah. Have respect, respect because they came out they came out of committee meetings. Yeah. I know in my building I work with twenty two of my staff members that wanted to be a part of this. And Part of the process was identifying what are the what are our big nugget values mm -hmm. that we have. What are the things that we really want to make sure our kids leave Memorial School with when we're done? And those were the four we came up with. And we and we wanted to because um, when we went to the trainings, we talked with other schools mm -hmm. and we asked if they had the same one for each school, and they were like, no, they personalized it for your school. So, but like us, we always say at KCI, and we didn't want to throw that out because we still have our KCI time. So we wanted to make sure that we had that embedded in time. It does. Mm -hmm. and so to totally change something like that that we've been doing for the past eight years, and then say, oh, we're doing a new acronym. Um, so my teachers felt very strongly that we wanted that as part of us. Mm -hmm. And then coming up with the, the word that would go, um, we've always had the same that, you know, we're like butterflies. The kids come to school to do and they come in like a little cocoon, and our job is to, you know, help them grow and help them reach what they need to do, and then we watch them blossom and fly off. So we've always used the butterfly analogy um, at our school. So we felt like the soaring the butterfly it just went with something that we've already been talking about. And the committee, you know, we value our committee mm -hmm. and their input, and it's it's not about Deb and I; it's about the staff. So that's why. And I can add one thing too. So we're taking representatives who are going to various trainings or involved in these committees and we're coming together to look at some of that vertical consistency in buildings. So um, as much as I can, I try to pop around at the different meetings and then I can share from one school to the other and we're meeting and trying to collaborate. So students are getting it vertically as well and building out these skills. So they can So you so by increasing your capacity creating project-based learning templates that you can use again and again. Are you talking about the third goal? Yes. This yes. Increase the capacity regarding beliefs, cultures, and context of modern learning project-based. Yes. Right? So, and encouraging them to do it. So when our teachers participated in PBL training this summer are also now modern learning take off, they came away with working with the teams to come up with different projects and we want to give them the autonomy to you know, student agency you will for themselves to create projects. We have a lot of teachers, I know my third grade, they're working with the specialists to create. We have the specialists will come in for periods and so they're working on units. So if they're doing maps or the, the town, they're gonna have Chelsea Stone, our art teacher, come in and she's gonna do some projects with them. So as they're doing projects, she'll be part of it or the music teacher will be part of it. So they're going to be working with different um, colleagues and not right. just their own classroom. So I'm excited because it's really um, supporting them in the flexibility of doing collaboration and vertical. You know, we have teachers that are doing projects that are going to go vertical. So it's always been your grade level, you might partner up with one teacher. And now they're partnering up with a number of teachers in the different content areas. So, so. So I would love to see examples as you develop them and create. Mm -hmm. It's really giving kids the opportunity so. to create, you know, to to ask a question about a real world situation, and then to address it and and come up with different potential solutions. Yeah. It's moving away from end of the unit projects, dioramas, if you will, right. or posters, if you will, into a you know, a, a much more authentic understanding and presentation um, of, of what they learn to the audiences. I'd love to give you an example of one that happened last year. My third grade did a restaurant where the kids had to create, they, they could design any type of restaurant they want. And what they had to do is they had the agency to pick. So they had to, you know, come up with how they were going to present it, but they incorporated the area and the perimeter and they talked about the area the perimeter and they had floor plans. And then we had, um, known as the Katianos of um, little um, Lowe's come in and then we had a couple other people who owned businesses and talked about some of the things they didn't think about like you know where the kitchen was going to be 
way the you know the freeze is going to be and then they had to present and they had to market their place and you know they had to have menus and they had to design you know what the cost be what, what type of clientele would come so it ended up not just being a, a little project it ended up incorporating the map and the science and everything into it, it was just what well, were you the best? Third grade. Third grade. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Do you remember how Jefferson was last year? <laughs> I'm over it. Look at my mouth. Okay. Super excited. I forgot <laughs> <about> <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to share. That's the exciting one that we are doing at Fisco. Um, and thank you to our school advisory council for <laughs> contributed to crafting this plan. Um, we, as a school, decided to adopt the mission of the district at MISCO. And we've been working um, all right under the driving question of who are we at MISCO? If this is who we are, what does it look like in our faculty and our working students? Um, so, as an offshoot of developing the mission, we then did work around developing our vision. We go back to the overall strategic planning committee lists um, and had gotten to look at who we would be in 2023. <clears throat> and we are now in the steps that we need to get there. So, a large part of that conversation we need to pull for this plan. We then looked at our values. Um, so, we this year in teacher schedules have three times where teachers are able to collaborate. We designated one as a student meeting time, so teachers talk about social emotional learning needs of students and design interventions, extensions um, as needed. We have a curriculum <coughs> time where our teachers work on continuing the curriculum mapping work that's gone on and looking at such a progress in learning and figure out how to best design the experience. And we have a strategic planning time dedicated to looking at the goals of the district strategic plan, our school improvement plan. Our teacher evaluation uh, goals and rubric because we want there to be a distinct through line through those things so that all the work that we do is connected and tied together. So it was especially gratifying this year to be able to collaborate with my colleagues from the elementary school, my colleagues from the high school in crafting the goals and plans. That was an inspirational line that has been among the efforts. So that is what led to the development of these goals. Also, I'm sorry, we had um, our feedback from the survey. And one of the nice things, you always hope to not be surprised from the feedback survey, uh, survey data from feedback. Uh -huh. I can't speak. Data from feedback surveys. And we were not. Everything in the survey we had either already completed work around, station around. So it's gratifying to see as we looked at last year's plan, we accomplished you know, this year's goals, um, to see that those things were in line. So these goals will look um, familiar because we just heard some of the goals from the elementary schools. Um, so we are too are looking at some social emotional learning and uh, PKS, positive behavior interventions. Um, several of us went to a training with Jessica Minahan last year, and one of her slides just stuck with me because I did teach content specifically on um, behavior. Why not teach behavior specifically? Really that's the crux of social emotional learning and our focus at MISCO. We get the idea of the magic word yet, students don't have it yet. They're continuously making poor choices, consistent making poor choices, and it's our job to help them develop those skills. We have lots of opportunities to work on this goal. We have a teacher led PDIS committee, we have book study opportunities, we have several teachers attending a training trainer. They can support the social emotional learning committee. So we have a PBIS committee, a social emotional learning committee. We have um, a resource officer, a strong guidance department. We have every student taking wellness and PD this year. So those groups will work in isolation and in collaboration throughout the year to develop social emotional learning curriculum and experiences for students. So we still will be looking at um, the process of developing our attributes at MISCO. Who are we? This is who we are, but yeah, to expect to see you know, students and adults in all the spaces in which we work and learn together, and developing matrix um, and bringing that to student I think one of the nice things about our goals is that they offer the opportunity for uh, families and students to engage. So we'll be having family members and students on the committees give feedback, putting lots of opportunities for that work as we move throughout the year. Just one, one quick question on this. Uh, one of the things we're aspiring to is that 
um, when we talk about who are we or what are we at, at Visco, it shouldn't be different because we went down a different hallway or we went into a different grade. And you know, our expectations for students, as well as the adults behavior in the building, should be the same for all. Um, it, it should be, you know, what are we expecting the students coming into fifth grade, and next into eighth grade? Um, and that the teams should have you know, similar expectations as well. So it shouldn't be on kid A, I'm walking down hallway B, and what's the rules and what are the expectations that I should have? Should we um, align? And I think that's some you know, one of the things that really came up when we looked at um, who we are and what we want to be. We really believe we all own all the students. Mm -hmm. um, and part of how we do that is look at our um, progress of the students. How do we know what kids are learning? How do we know what we need to learn next? So understanding though the expectations are the same, everybody has a different entry point. Figuring out what that entry point is and where our next move is in getting students to move forward. Our second goal is around communication practices. Um, and this is a, a two level piece. I think part of it is the what's happening at MISCO that's so important for our community to be aware of the amazing experiences happening for kids and adults. Um, so, how do we communicate consistently about that? But also, how do we communicate about student progress in terms of? Um, achievement and how we monitor that. So we're talking about communication in terms of creating continuous feedback loop so that students, families, teachers are all engaged in knowing where kids are and what we need to do to move forward to what we're next. We realized, um, I think Mrs. Swain and Mrs. Gallagher spoke to this in that we have lots of methods for communicating. So we want to sit back a little bit and look at are we unintentionally disorganizing families with all these different methods and, and um, what teacher or what team or what grade they're in in terms of how things are communicated to you and how we tighten it up so that if this is who we are and so this is what it looks like. Not to say that we expect everything to be the same across all classrooms, teams, grade levels, but that everyone can speak to what everyone else is doing and why. So we come at this from a point of common understanding and common development. O3 is around project-based learning. We took a look at modern learning um, and what it means for us at MISCO in terms of where we are now. And we have 10 teachers who participated in the PBL 101 workshop and training. So we felt that making this goal have a tighter focus really on project-based learning itself was a good next step for MISCO. Um, I think, Sean, in the answer to your question, there is a design process to project based learning, and so these teachers have um, different kids exposure experience with that now. So at MISCO, we're always looking to tap the next layer of teacher leaders. Um, so you have your pioneer group in year one, who are really helped us drive the work, and now we look around it. Who's the next layer of it? Who's the next layer to um, start sharing this important work? It's a beautiful, amazing group of teachers who are working so hard in this realm. So I just can't wait to see this year unfold, but let's see if people start to share the practices and skills and the projects. Um, so understand that design process and bring them to the practice will be a big part of our work this year. Yeah, so that's what if you could give me a, a, a <coughs> snapshot of that. Hold on, we have a slide. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here's one. Talk about it. Uh, our PE teachers um, are teaching an elective to set the graders this year. It's a little bit different than how they had done it in the past. And we've been talking to teachers a lot about student agency on the network project based learning. And we are talking about the feedback loop and engaging students and having a voice. So, one of the things students had a voice in was recess at MISCO and how we can improve the recess experience. So, part of it was to make it longer, but part of it is to make it more active so that they're not out there milling around and um, don't just be on the phone. So there's nothing else to do. So, we, I don't think. Mr. McGinnis will mind us saying that you can teach old dogs new tricks because we had great conversation with them around curriculum and design and what could this elective be? And what if we just made this PE elective, what could happen at recess? So the kids researched games, designed games, decided what they needed for materials, this was seventh and eighth graders, and then went to recesses and taught the games to different sixth graders. So we felt like that's project-based learning, an authentic outcome. They were able to take the learning on the road, if it was a lot of work, if it was their interests, their ideas, here's a problem, it needs a solution. So that's kind of the, in a nutshell, the design process. There's a few red thoughts about that. So, yeah, I'll tell you, yeah. the input, input, when we implemented it, it was really cool because the kids, 
uh, that have designed this, they just went out and started doing it. And then kids kind of organically wonder, us, hey, what are you doing? Well, we're playing this game. Would you like to learn how to play the game? So, um, you know, when we think back about maybe some of our experiences in uh, recess, um, kind of created our own games because that's the way it was. Uh, well, the kids nowadays don't have that experience. So I think it was a, it was a great opportunity for our kids to, you know, take a look at, well, what are games you can play in a 20-minute span? And really got good at what that game was. Um, some, and the kids that were teaching it were, some of them were learning those games for the first time too, so it was that learning. And then they were, you know, teaching it to students and they loved it. You know, they really, like me just can teach more. So, um, yeah, so it's them taking the lead and it really... It wasn't just pulling the flies and sending them all out there to right, see what yeah, happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because <laughs> the PE teachers talked to the kids about, you're working with the grader and social emotional learning guys, what might be some of the challenges as you teach the game and how can you respond? And, um, so it's so multi-layered. The picture on the right is a math class where students generated their own hierarchy of questions and then come up with ways to approach solving. So you can see that in this classroom, this is just two different um, versions of what was happening. There were kids all over the class doing all the and some were teaching each other, some were getting help from a teacher as they worked through. Goal four is uh, specific to MISCO in that um, we're looking at school safety and school education just because it's an area where we lag a little bit and we need to catch up to what our colleagues and other schools um, that are doing. So we are so excited to have Officer Sego, who's already had a huge impact, just his presence. Um, Amazingly strong at what he does, and invested and enthusiastic. Um, and then through our school advisory council, we start school notification committee that we need to remember students and students' ideas. Um, we're thinking of so we're going to adopt a highway approach. So we'll ask kids, we've asked kids to, in our first also meeting, to look at this through the lens of what's a problem like a potential complex solution to. And so we'll start having specific feedback Fridays um, borrowing from. Um, food for thought. <laughs> for our friend that wants food for thought, um, where Paul and I are available to just collect feedback from students and also, also talk to them about what their solutions, okay, how we get there. And, um, and teachers know that we schedule all the opportunities that they can tie to the community in the classrooms. Um, the safety committee is well underway. Lots of work. I think it's great to have officer safety guys all around the building and get you know, things through the lens. Um, well. Social-emotional learning is supposed to be the place to be. The students on the left are at Memorial School. These are some of our student council students from last year. I'm talking about the um, And I'm just taking pride in their school. And some happy teachers on the right are at the school. Okay. Um, and a big thank you, Lashley, we're the best school advisory council and we have an outstanding group of chairs as well. We have those conversations and feedback on the back as well. Any questions? I have a question. Yeah. So we just talked about elementary schools, PBIS, and they have SOAR and RISE. Mm -hmm. Is there, like, are you is the middle school going to come up with their like four big rocks, like kind of like elementary school is doing that obviously would parallel in many ways mm -hmm. what's going on in elementary school. So it continues up? Yes. Through the chain? We talked about, um, so we have some teachers with experience in the they have who have been trained and done in other districts. Um, we're really excited to bring this opportunity to MISCO. Um, so that becomes part of the design process for some things into place. So if it's not an acronym, We'll still have our attributes that are central to who we are. Um, and the kids will probably decide they want that kind of tomorrow. Ours or whatever it is. Yeah, I'm not suggesting that it needs an acronym. <clears throat> I was just more curious from a parental standpoint, <clears throat> like what will the big rocks say? Right. And I think it's important that everybody at Wisco can name Exactly. So a short list that really is meaningful and otherwise. And, you know, to kind of follow up on that too, Jen, I feel like whatever those big rocks are, they permeate everything. Mm -hmm. They permeate recess, they permeate the bus stop, mm -hmm. they permeate mm -hmm. hallways, mm -hmm. whatever. So I think it's really important to include the parents in knowing what mm -hmm. those four big rocks that right. your parents are <coughs> to say them 
as well because we you know communicate to our kids what their expectations are as well so in our actions that you'll see with development of the matrix there's lots of opportunity to share progress throughout the whole process mm -hmm. we want parents to not only understand our matrices but the process yeah and how we got there and yeah our student voice was part of it and their parent voice was part of it all this data and the index surveys and um to how that comes to be yeah i think that's great Question. You mentioned, I think, that there would be families and students on committees. So, mm -hmm. which specifically committee? I mean, there's a, a bunch of committees that you mentioned. There's SEL, PDAS, there's the School of Beautification, yep. safety. safety and Beautification will treat as two separate committees. Our social emotional learning, PBIS, which will point will want to engage parent voice and reach out to parents. So, I think um, best practice is anytime we can pull in stakeholder voices, we will moving forward. Um, so I think that people should look at those opportunities. And we'll ask parents to look at this through the same lens. So if you see a problem, mm -hmm. come have a solutions-based conversation and join us mm -hmm. in this work, because it's really important. We have, uh, we have some requirements, the resources needed, financial support on a couple of these for the for the beautification and safety efforts. Are, are they in alignment with the budget so far? Or so far, I think a lot of people need to make that right and that kind of support. There are some we already um, have the stairs to get to the ball field. We have a new platform in the teachers. So I have taken um, a really in depth building tour with our director of um, and our athletic director. And we just took pages of this, 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 the three of us looking together. It was the bright eyes at the time. So then we created the plan. Um, and then also I created a five year. Um, and now things like whiteboards and carpeting and paint and really make sure that those things are continuously and updated so we don't find ourselves in this everything all at once. To kind of follow up on, on number two about engaging the community as partners in learning, just kind of as a general comment, getting more press in our local newspaper mm -hmm. I think would be super helpful to show the community, look at the great things that are happening mm -hmm. in our school, look how we're getting these things done. I mean, I think about your outdoor learning classroom, Jan, and it's like, okay, look, somebody from the school community stepped forward and donated their services. Mm -hmm. But the more that we get the press out there, right. that we're all in this together and we're working together to better our schools and improve mm -hmm. our community, I, I think that can only help us. Definitely. We create example goals for educators to use if they wanted to or not. They're aligned with the district strategic plan and our school field plan goals. And part of the action steps, um, we included to communicate out what's going on within that goal, within that work, to um, the community less work has been awesome in supporting our work at this um, We include <coughs> grant writing as an action step, we included um, piloting technology as an action step, so that we keep continuous focus on those things. And that might be an opportunity for the community to have some of our community initiatives. I love, I love school beautification. I think and student agency, and I think yeah, that's a really important thing. Mm -hmm. I haven't been by the school. Yes, yes. from our so school next, garden. Next week, it's going to have to like pop. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, pumpkins, that's so awesome. awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah it's beautiful. That's great. So, thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I feel the pull of the podium. <laughs> <laughs> How was everybody? So thanks for the chance to present uh, the School for Root Planter, and I'm glad to share, and excited to come after my colleagues and to see the alignment of the work in the district, and that we're all sort of pulling in the same direction and going about it in our different ways that reflect our school culture. My 20th year at NITMUC, I've never been more excited about the work that we're doing, so I'm gonna give you sort of the lightning round review of the work and the goals that we have. First goal that we have, um, sort of abbreviated to be explore, connect, and reflect. And so last year, while we were going through the district process to come up with the strategic plan, NITMUC had its parallel process going on where all faculty members and hun literally hundreds of kids had the chance to participate, as well as community members, in creating our beliefs about learning, our definition of learning, our call to action, our core values. And so if, I had, if you'd asked me last year at this time where I wanted to be, I would have told you, Document set, published, pedal to the metal, let's go. 
Um, and I think what I realized is that over the summer was that although so many people contributed to it, we haven't talked about it enough. And we haven't had the chance, just as you said, explore it, find the parts of it that are personally meaningful, both for teachers and students, connect to it, and then reflect on how it's going to impact practice. And so this is the go slow to go fast year. Uh, I'll only go slow if go fast comes right after it. We're doing that in a lot of different ways. Um, again, you've heard um, other principals talk about the model, model goals that are out there. Excited now that we're up to six model goals with more than 160 action steps. To me, this is a huge part of my instructional leadership in helping teachers to take their ideas and their aspirations and turn them into actions. We're bumping up about 100% of people so far, just beneath, have taken on these goals voluntarily, which I think speaks to the faculty too, and that they are interested, they're willing, they want to try things, and if, you're, if we're giving them the support, they're going to put these ideas into action. So you can see there's some new goals from last time. We're continuing with lead learners with our monthly workshop, our reimagined leadership team meetings, where they're open not only to department chairs, but every teacher in the school and every kid in the school. But we're consistently getting about 30 to 50 people on a monthly basis to talk about where we're headed, how we're gonna get there, and the action steps that we'll take together. First one of these is coming up next week where we talk about reimagining our 21st century learning conferences, which we're exciting about. Jen mentioned food for thought lunches. We'll continue with those again this year. You know, last year we took all the responses from the 200 kids who participated and put them into word clouds to pull out the themes that jumped out really quickly. And some of those ideas we've been able to turn into action this year. We have a whole new bank of questions that we'll be asking over the course of the year to help our kids give feedback and kind of reimagining what the future is going to look like. This year we involved our freshmen from the first days through the doors of the school by reimagining that freshman introduction session that used to be a meeting in an auditorium when we said don't do this and don't do that or this is what's going to happen. Uh, we held eight small group meetings with freshmen. We had a chance to meet them for about an hour apiece, 45 minutes to an hour, and we ran an activity with them where they were immediately sharing their voice about the things they love about school and the things they love to see changed about school. Additionally, we talked about what their strengths are, what they bring to our community, and how they are an important part of the school. I talked about how this is a unique situation where 25% of your organization turns over in a single year. And so that is a huge opportunity for us to welcome in 25% new strengths, new abilities, new talents, different diversity of, of individuals and ideas. So we were excited to do that, and I'm already getting to know all the freshmen on top of it, which has been nice. Uh, this year we're opening up some community digital conversations. So on November 14th, we're gonna try and engage people from the comfort of their own homes. You're all invited through Zoom technology by having a conversation with folks about the direction the school's going. Some driving questions, and I'm hopeful to bring in a surprise guest that would um, provide an outside perspective on the work that we're doing as well. But trying just to meet people where they're at, it's challenging to make it out of our homes for the meetings we have in our calendars. But what if I told you you could do it in your PJs, from your kitchen table, with a cup of coffee? So hopefully that will work as well. This is some of the most exciting work we have ahead of us. Am I pitching it to Sean? But I can <laughs> Some of the most exciting work we have is the idea of the portrait of the graduate and working with my colleagues in the, in the, the strategic planning committee. That is maybe the most exciting thing that came out of the strategic plan for me because I see it as a through line pre-K all the way to 12 of what we want for our kids. And so the questions come up about defining what success looks like with this new plan and what this new version of school looks like. And here at Nipmuc, I see the portrait of the graduate as being the uh, compass for that. So what we will be doing is looking at the skills, dispositions, and the knowledge embedded in the portrait of the graduate and designing rubrics and experiences that go with this. Not bread and butter experiences, but the kinds of experiences we want all kids to have by the time they graduate. We've already engaged parents, community members, kids, and faculty through face-to-face -face and digital conversation last year. I've got a bank of about 80 ideas that people would like to see happen. This year, we're going to put that on PEDs and we're going to figure out exactly how we can take those ideas put them into process. Maureen mentioned the training that's taking place next week. I think that's going to be a building block for this. And I'm excited to put kids in the driver's seat of building those rubrics and handing it over to faculty members so that we sort of re reverse the dynamic and allow teachers then to take those ideas and refine them. Goal two, I'll move through quickly, is the idea of community partnerships. We began this work last year with the Community Advisory Board, sort of our reimagined school council bringing in parents pre-K through 12 to participate in 
shaping our programming and adding their ideas to what, what schools should look like. A great group. Um, we kick it off again this fall, sharing a lot of the work that we've done with strategic planning district-wide and school-wide, which is a great confluence of ideas and figuring out how we can make our classrooms look a little bit more like the real world. A big part of that will happen through our community partnership projects. By February, we'd like to take the work that happened last year and build it into a bank of a minimum of 20 community partnership projects, meaning real world examples, community leaders, organizations, companies, public service, uh, community, community um, service organizations that have real jobs that can be done by our army of high school students who are talented and bright and willing to do their work, willing to do work that makes a difference in the lives of others. So a couple of examples that came out last year was the home run with Cumberland Farms, where they were looking for a game uh, idea, a game concept for their app. You ever used that app? The user of it, not just because they're a good partner, but I use it to pay for gas at the pump. I don't need my wallet. It's a great tool for them, but they want kids using it. So kids can go in and get the candy bar or buy the Gatorade or the Powerade. And so they said, how can we come up with a game design? They brought it to our business marketing program. We had about 40 students who break into teams, come up with game designs. The top few teams were able to go to Cumberland Farms, present it in the boardroom to the CEO, and get real feedback from real executives about the real work that matters. Those are the kinds of projects that we're looking for. The idea of taking history, taking a conflict in history, maybe the Vietnam War, going to a senior center, and taking the learning out of the textbook and putting it into the members, the recollection, recollections, the experiences of our community members who can make that learning experience real and meaningful video blogs, reflections, uh, journals, writing their story for them. Powerful opportunity. They're out there waiting for us. And our job by February is to have a bank of them so that our teachers can look and say, yes, I want to try this thing. But I need a partner from another discipline. Who's going to give it a shot? So we have a number of action steps put in place in order to help that happen. We're also reimagining these 21st century learning conferences coming into our fourth year. We brought in hundreds of partners and now have challenge some of the norms of the day from hour-long classes to full-day classes, from being in school to being outside on uh, local parks, working with park rangers to having classes taught by kids. We're going to rebrand the name this year, feeling like maybe this is a little bit stale. We're working our way into the 21st century pretty well right now. So maybe they're going to be thrive conferences. Maybe they're going to be agency conferences. I'm not sure, but our kids and our teachers are going to come up with that new name and brand for it on October 9th for free cycle. Goal three, lightning round continues. Social, emotional, and learning needs of all kids. Beginning with the health and the wellness of our kids and the programming we're putting in place to support that. From the SOS program, which we began looking at uh, after some of the school shootings, a program promoted by the Sandy Hook Promise about identifying students who are disconnected from the school or struggling with social and emotional issues. Um, and then also made even more important by some of the sadness that we uh, went through as a school community last year looking to help identify kids who are struggling, connect them to resources, connect them to all of us. The Metro West Health Data Survey will continue to be important. Leslie McGinnis, our school nurse, is doing some great work in talking about how to collect that data in this November, but more importantly, when we get the feedback back in May to make it actionable and design programming that's responsive to our student needs and continuing with our expert programming. We'll continue with Wellness Weeks this year. They are growing and evolving and getting better. We'll have two this year. This year, ex our school counselors are doing a phenomenal job. They're adding a wellness fair to it, which is turning into almost a full day activity rather than just an advisory activity. The idea of Wellness Weeks is to teach and provide on wellness activities that not only make an impact that day, that week, but can be used throughout the entire year to make our kids, our staff, all of us a little bit healthier. Uh, what's really exciting too is that they are coming into their second year of offering professional development on wellness weeks we'll host a session here in the spring just prior to our wellness week and then welcome all participants back at schools across massachusetts and as i made my way to the state ministry association last year or pardon me last week i had people coming up to me saying hey we're doing our first wellness week hey we're gonna get it's not called wellness week but it's called this and we're trying it but uh, their idea and their awesome work and ideas now spreading to schools across the Commonwealth. Continuing with, with co-teaching, providing the support to provide an inclusive learning experience for all of our kids, providing them with the education and the support that they need to be successful. And in the course, we now have 11 co-taught uh, sections here, 10 courses, which is powerful. We no longer have kids pulled out. We're changing the level of expectation 
they're in with their peers, they're experiencing what's a, a typical high school experience, and what do you know, they're also achieving at higher rates as well. So we're really excited about providing the support for that to grow. The district did some phenomenal work looking at homework. We include this in the idea of wellness and learning needs of all kids because we heard super clearly from our students that this is a burden. The work of being a high school student has never been more challenging, and we need to, we need to listen to them and make sure that homework is appropriate, not eliminate it, but that the assignments are the right assignments, that the work is the right work, and that we're being responsive to the students' um, schedules, busy schedules beyond the school day. So we'll be putting that into place this year. And um, because I'm going lightning round here, I also included a link for you to the Muck Roadmap, which is, switch over, our, our digital timeline of the work that we're doing here at Nipmuc. Um, what's really exciting is that for last year we started this timeline and shared it out as a way to really share the work that's going on here in the school with a broader, broader, a broader audience, <clears throat> keep it transparent, allow people to connect with it. So I've given you this, this is updated for this school year. You have links, everything from shadow a student to our uh, professional development sessions we'll be offering, the Mercer Leads, Inspired Learning Project, the book studies that are going on. Um, heard from Will Richardson earlier this um, fall that he's now, Will Richardson provided some training for our district last year. He makes his way really across the globe sharing out how schools can reimagine that. This has now made its way into his presentation as one of the resources of schools that are thinking about things differently, trying new ideas. I don't share any of this with you to say that we have figured it out because that's not the message. I'll remind you of that slide I shared when I met with you about a month ago that a graduate last year said, you know, the thing I love about Nipmuc is that someone's going to try something new. Sometimes it succeeds, sometimes it fails, but we're giving it a shot. And um, I'm really proud of the faculty. We've been having a lot more successes than failures to their hard work. So feel free to check this out. And it's a living document, and we'll keep it up to date throughout the school year. Quick overview of where we're at. So Sean, I have a question about, I have a question about the homework initiative. I know there's a lot of things going on. I think Marty was working on a survey around the school district and all the teaching professionals. So we, we have a draft guidelines and, uh, that we worked on last year with the district committee. So we have our next meeting actually this Wednesday um, to look at a review the guidelines and see what we're at with feedback on that date and see if it as soon as we're ready and that committee says yes, we're going to go and we're going to schedule time with the committee, some of the representatives to come and present those guidelines. But um, then as part of our strategic action plans, um, it's to then you know continue and bring it back to the schools and we can start to implement it once okay. we roll it out. Because I would I would really like to see that in detail and see what that whole thing means. So I obviously I'm not a teaching professional, but I am a parent professional at this point. <laughs> so, so I would, I would like to see you know how that's going to impact really, the experience of kids are going to have. Based off the draft that we currently have, and if we're going to get more feedback this week, I'm really pleased with what we have. It's based off of our experiences from all stakeholder groups, and those students that were around the table, they influenced us greatly. Um, in these conversations, and we also looked at data from uh, parents, mm -hmm. students, you know, teachers. It's it, I, I feel really good about our beliefs that we put in there, our vision, our purpose, mm -hmm. and then we're going to need to work through. I think we're going to be working through the implementation of it, and that's going to take some time to then let's go back, assess what we're currently doing, and what we want to change to meet our aim of district goals and expectations. You recommended a really good book on, on homework and, and some of the uh, studies that have been done and kind of the scientific evidence around appropriate homework and, and those types of things. Um, I'm really curious about the types of metrics we can put in place to understand exactly what type of homework, how effective it is, and then is it actually applicable to what they're trying to accomplish. Um, I had a couple of cases just this year where um, they a uh, teacher will give out homework and it's not even, it's not appropriate to the test that she planned on preparing them for. So there's there's things like that that are little hiccups that, that may cause some trauma at home. Yes. <laughs> I hear you. As a parent, I, I understand for sure. Yeah. 
So, Corey, if you had to put a timeline on it in terms of when we're going to see it, what would you say? Well, we set a timeline <laughs> by November 1st. Okay. But our next meeting is Wednesday. I'm hoping we'll come out of the meeting with that being that final document. I'm guessing that's when we'll be, and then we'll be able to present either at the end of October or at the beginning in a, a couple meetings from now. Um, but I also respect our committee, and it's possible they may say, okay, we want to look at this, we want to get more info. And um, we had agreed at the end of last year that we were going to come back and take a fresh look at it um, and add more of the information into it based on what we had at the end of last year. So it's, it's pretty close, I would say. And we, we want to roll it out sooner than later, but we also want it to be the right document. I also think we should put in a little bit of time for us to consume it and try sure. to understand it. Yeah. So you know, instead of, I, I don't want to have it be presented to us and then we go around at that meeting or something like that. So please, please budget that amount of time as well. The book that's listed out there, the Rethinking Homework, is the book that we used with the committee. In addition, we used other research articles and articles that were out there to inform it, but that's been around a while, but it's excellent. That's kind of the go-to book that districts use. So our plan is, as part of the rollout with homework and to communicate to parents as well, where this is going to be a teacher read, but also a recommended community read. Um, we're trying to have a few maybe community reads later on this year that align the books that align with our practices. And so I'm glad that you put that out there because that's something we'll take a look at. And obviously, we anticipate that this is going to be a success, that it's going to transform the way we do. Boy, it would be fun to have communication done on that, you know, mm -hmm. because that's that impacts the community directly every single day. Yeah. So it would be fun to get some kind of communication going. I think it's going to take a little while to get there. And so we, we even struggled. You know, I said the first goal is explore, connect, reflect. It almost felt like it belonged there because just as you were saying, take some time to digest, understand what the guidelines are to find what you agree with personally as a student, parent, teacher, and then to think, okay, how's this gonna impact the practice, what's gonna look like? At the same time, we felt like it trumped, it was trumped by student wellness because just as you said, it's impacting everybody every single day. But I agree with that point. I think our, our job as leaders is to find that embedded time for faculty, keep the conversation going, and give people the chance to connect with it so that we don't have a different definition at the you know, in the scope to the public yeah, memorial. I think the work of the committees awesome and it's not common and you hear different districts trying it but um, they set us up to have some really powerful impactful conversation so i have john you mentioned some Sure. So the timeline on Metro West is November 15th. We will administer it school wide. We take an hour on the day, administer the test. We get our first glimpse of data. It's a truncated data sheet in mid March. And then by the end of May, we get the full results. Um, what we're excited about is that because of the work of Leslie and the emphasis in the district and the school on wellness, we're already anticipating the ways that we can use that data. Um, and how we can develop programming that will directly support it, whether it's tying into wellness weeks or building off of the SOS program and what we're building in there. Um, but rather than having the data come in in May and sit over a summer and then start to analyze it, we'd really like to be able to hit the ground running so that we're ready to do something with it. If you talk to the other schools that administer the data, there's some trends. Um, our trends nearly across the board were positive last year, but there are others that are going in the other direction. We're hearing from all different kinds of schools of issues like vaping. And that's becoming increasingly an issue for high schools. So we want to be able to take that data, know exactly what the concerns are, be able to create programming that addresses that. That's an example. Is there any way that we could, as a district, look, I just feel like one of the things that frustrates me about the Metro West survey is that it is administered now we tend to not get any feedback on it because it's administered externally. Is there any way that we could be doing some things internally, say like on homework, that we could do check-ins with our students and be surveying our students to say, hey, how are we doing? Instead of waiting for that full loop. Yeah, that, that was a huge emphasis behind starting the Food for Thought lunches and trying to give them a chance 
not just when talking about the academics, but the parts of the school culture that needed adjustment. And you know, homework's a good example of that, or it came directly out of that. So that's a piece of it. The SOS um, training that all staff will go through, and then the assessment that's given out to kids will start at a single grade level. But that's going to provide us with quicker data back about who are kids who are most in need of services, who are kids who are most in need of connecting to the school. So I, I think I think it's a matter of taking those and being looking to make them actionable as quickly as we can. So food, can you tell me a little bit more about Food for Thought, John, yes. and how many kids are involved in Food for Thought? I would love to. <laughs> um, we have last year, uh, we began this process. We ran 12 over the course of uh, the school year. The Food for Thought lunches run like a typical lunch where we invite students. Um, I'll tell you about that process in a second. We invite them to the gathering room and we provide teachers the chance to, uh, to sign up in advance. So last year we had about 80 percent of our teachers voluntarily give up a lunch block to come meet with kids. Three to four, three to five teachers, about 15 to 20 students. What we do is we provide them with a series of questions. Last year we had consistent questions. So if I could change one thing in our school, what would it be? Wish my teachers and administrators knew. We're trying to tap into the stress, the frustration, the things that we just don't see because we're adults. Beyond friends, what gets you to school every day? What words just used to describe the culture? Favorite moment of learning in school? advice for teachers, questions you want to ask the teachers and administrators. We took those, we have chart paper up around the room. After uh, lunch, the kids get up, they provide their answers. It's very social lab, we've got music playing, usually an 80s mix, the most 80s. Um, we then take, we then have everybody go find another a comment they did not write that resonates with them. And we start a conversation. And that's when the teachers first get the chance to participate by asking clarifying questions or just looking for more input from the kids. Um, we provide the desserts for them, so hopefully it makes a little bit of incentive <laughs> to get there. It's been a really powerful conversation, but what we do after that, in order to make it a little more actionable, talking for talking's sake doesn't always help, is we take all those pieces of chart paper and we type every single response into a live Google Doc. That live Google Doc collects um, all, their in, all their input, and very quickly, I'm going to show you, no very quickly, you can see the themes that come out. From our students. So like right here, this was, I wish my teachers and administrators knew. I don't know if you can see that. And that doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what their main concern is. Look at the next one. What questions would you like to ask your teachers or administrators? Again, number one, homework. And the questions were, why do you sign it? What, why do you give this particular amount? What's the purpose of this one? Uh, if you could give one bit of advice to teachers, students, or administrators, what would it be? Class, homework, learning, opportunities, some lectures shows up. These are the ones where you start to look at some of the subboards and themes come out pretty quickly. Outside school, time, what's your favorite moment of learning so far? That, right? Real work that matters, right? The university, the kids who are part of that program, are doing something meaningful beyond the walls of the school and it resonates with them. The 21st century learning conferences jump out. Look at those big numbers. Those two days are universally recognized by kids. How would you describe the culture? Welcoming, friendly, diverse, accepting. We don't cut anything from these word clouds. We keep them all in. Uh, beyond friends, what would you look at, look forward to? Learning, sports, teachers, meetings. So it's a way very quickly. And then if you click on these things, you can get all of their answers as well. So that it's totally transparent. People can see the answers that come out. Um, it's a way to get feedback, but more than that, more than just listening, it's a way to do something. So I love all that. I think that's fabulous. I think that's very general, but I think sometimes the, the feedback that, that specific teachers need to hear is more specific and less general. Is there any device that, that a teacher would utilize to kind of say, gee, how am I doing with my students? How are they feeling about their homework load? How are they feeling about my teaching style? And, and I'm sorry I'm going so long, but you know it's like you're totally setting me up, which is great. <laughs> so, um, we've rethought the idea of educator evaluation. This is just from a training website. This is sort of a traditional uh, student learning goal. This is put out by the Massachusetts Department of Education as a model goal. Let's take a look at it and then try and wrap your head around it. In order to ensure mathematical literacy, three content areas, here are the metrics. I want to see the kids are proficient. This is what a traditional learning goal looks like. I won't, I won't read the whole thing. 
I'm not a big fan. I'm not a big fan of that. I am a big fan of the idea of student learning being measured by reflection. And so we have suggested to our teachers, rather than creating the goal with kind of an artificial manufactured learning target of 80% of people that proficient in open response questions, why don't you get 100% of your teacher, of your kids, to, re to reflect on what you're doing? This was taken by over 90% of the faculty last year. So 90% of the faculty on a monthly basis tried something new, something out of their comfort zone from that bank of 160 60 action steps. And then after they did it, they gave their kids a Google form and said, how did it go, an anonymous Google form, so that they could get immediate feedback from their classes about what's working, what's not working, how do I adjust? And they're coming back for the video this year. And so we've talked a lot about the fact that getting a negative review is not a bad thing in this. This is a chance to get feedback, build it into the loop, make improvements. It's what we're all about. You asked about core values earlier. I was so glad when we voted our core values this last year that you can see it right over here. Um, reflection showed up with 25, uh, about 64% of our people voted for reflection. It's a core part of being a student and educator now is looking at your work, making adjustments to practice as you go. The fact that they have embraced this way of doing model learning goals means that nearly 100% of the people on a monthly basis are asking their kids, how am I doing? Tell me what I can do better. It's not perfect. I'm, I'm not saying it is, but so that's it's, it's already been going on. Yeah, it's going on now. Oh, okay. like this year or last year? All of last year. All of last year. Yeah, over ninety percent of people did it last year. What was cool too is when they were submitting their evaluation materials, they're submitting oftentimes their complete Google form results, spreadsheets where they I see every student comment about what worked and what didn't, and then they're picking the two or three really highlights and picking the two or three lowlights and saying. I can do better with this. This is how I'm going to do it this year. I just met with a teacher who took a goal. She's doing the same goal as she did last year. But she said, John, I'm doing it over again because I can make it better. They told me how to make this thing better. And so I'm all in favor of that. That's not a teacher being lazy or resting on her laurels. That's a teacher who is reflective, thinking, working, striving to get better through the feedback of kids. So I'm 100% in favor of that. Great. Thank you. I tried to be quick. <laughs> Ask me questions at this table. Thank you. You can tell I'm passionate about it. I appreciate your time. <laughs> All right. So we need some motions and votes to accept the action. Can we do them collectively? Like all mm -hmm. four plans all yeah. at the same time? Yeah. Motion to accept the action plans for 2019 2019. Second. Is there any further discussion about any of the school action plans presented this evening? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the 2018 19 um, school plans. Aye. Aye. They are approved unanimously. Thank you. Um, so next we have correspondence. Is there any correspondence that needs to be reviewed? All right, see no indication. We shall move on. Um, are there other matters not anticipated by this committee within 48 hours of posted meeting time? None. Future agenda items include the annual evaluation of the superintendent by the school committee on October 15th and the accountability MCAS results on October 15th as well, uh, in addition to the policy uh, changes that we mentioned. All right, um, so committee will accept the motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Meetings adjourned at 815. Thank you. Hey, John. <laughs>